Thank you. Uh, thank you, Janice, for that very kind invitation. I, I do want to um, just echo what I think everyone's um, said before that, and I know there were some maybe concerns from the audience that, you know, how do you, how do you find a good doctor and are we, you know, trying to do the right things for you? And in the melanoma field, we're very, very fortunate because I think it's a very close-knit community of doctors and researchers. Um, um, you know, we all know each other. We all know what each other is doing. Uh, and we're all very, very, very interested in working together to try to try to make things better for for melanoma, the field, and for all of you. Um, and and so um, and that's what's important about this thing. And so I do want to thank Valerie and Abbott Melanoma for bringing these, bringing you guys all together for this symposium. Because another critical component of having us be able to advance the field is you guys. Now, this is a team effort. It's not just the laboratory folks or the surgeons or the doctors, but we can't do this without you guys. So this is a team thing. I'm so glad you guys are here so early on a Saturday morning um, to learn about what we're doing and kind of learn how we can work together to, to improve outcomes. So with that, what I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about some uncommon subtypes of melanoma, some types of melanoma that you may, maybe didn't even know existed. And these are melanomas that arise from the eye and melanomas that arise from the mucosal surfaces. And these are very, very, very distinct diseases from skin cancer, from skin melanoma. Um, you know, even though they all arise from the melanocytes, which are the pigment cells of the body, um, the way they become cancer, the way they behave, and the way we have to treat them are very, very different. So I've been asked to try to keep this short so we stay on time. So I'm going to try to talk about a lot of things in a short period of time. But just in the way of background, um, ocular melanoma is a disease, for the most part, that rises from something called the uveal tract of the eye. And the uveal tract is made up of uh, three parts, um, one called the choroid, which is, let me see if I can show you here, which is what I've outlined here, which is this middle layer of the eye. It's a very vascular layer between the outside white part of the eye and the inside retina. It can also arise from what's called the ciliary body of the eye, which is this muscular layer that makes these aqueous humors of the eye. Um, and it can also arise uncommonly from the iris, which is the pigmented part of the eye around the pupil. Ocular melanoma can also come from the conjunctiva, which is um, kind of the mucosal surface of the eye that just lines it, but that's pretty uncommon. It can also come from the orbit and eyelid. Um, so, so the majority of this disease uh, we call uh, uveal melanoma because it comes from that uveal tract. Again, this is very, very, very distinct from cutaneous melanoma. It's an orphan disease, which means it's a rare one. There are about 1,500 cases a year in the United States. Uh, as opposed to about the 75 or 80,000 cases of melanoma overall. So this is just a small proportion of this disease. Um, and the, the genetics, the molecular profile, the circuitry of this disease is completely different. Uh, and importantly, until last year, um, there was no effective systemic therapy for this disease once it spread. Um, and so, um, you know, as with skin melanoma, um, you know, not too long ago, um, where we really were, were searching for effective therapies. This is kind of where we are now with eye melanoma. And so this is a disease for which the standard of care really is clinical trial participation. Because um, uh, remember, uh, this is a situation where you know, we don't have anything else. And so we really need to find something that works. This is um, kind of a snapshot of, of where we were not too long ago in terms of uh, therapies for melanoma. And these are systemic therapies. And, before, 2000, before 2011, this is all we had. We had chemotherapy, something called DTIC or decarbazine, and IV chemotherapy that's um, sometimes used now, but relatively uncommonly. Uh, interferon you heard about, which is approved in what we call the adjuvant setting after a section of high-risk disease to help try to prevent it from coming back. Um, and then IL-2 was approved also, uh, which is a therapy that Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Maynard gives here. <clears throat> But something happened <laughs> between 1998 and 2011. You can see that just since March of 2011, there's really been, um, you know, I, I would call this an explosion in new therapies for this disease. And, and this explosion is really made possible, um, you know, by work that, you know, people like Dr. Goidos is doing in the laboratory, trying to understand, you know, how does the disease work? How can we, how can we treat it? And that led to a series of clinical trials that led to approval of, of ipilimumab, which is Yervoy, or that anti-CTLA-4 antibody. And that was approved in March of 2011. Uh, Vemurafenib is one of those BRAF inhibitors, and that was also approved in 2011. 
Um, you heard Dr. Kaufman talk about dibrafenib and trametinib, two of these other inhibitors of this MAT kinase pathway approved in 2013. And just very, very recently, pembrolizumab, which is the anti-PD-1 antibody, was approved. So really now, we have a big armamentarium of treatments for patients with advanced melanoma. But what's important here is the development of these drugs was primarily for patients with skin melanoma. Okay, so the question is, do these drug, drugs work in these other kind of uncommon types of melanoma, like, like eye melanoma or mucosal melanoma? And the experience is, is pretty limited. Um, our group looked at uh, whether ipilimumab or CTLA-4 inhibition could work in, in eye melanoma. Um, and, you know, even at a center like Memorial, where we have a relatively high volume of patients, you know, between 2008 and 2012, you know, we only had 20. Um, and this, this kind of outlines that experience of those 20, but also highlights um, uh, not just, it highlights the need for why we have to work together, you know. Um, but anyway, so the 20 patients that we had uh, were all, uh, average age was about 61 years old. Um, most of these patients had at least some other prior therapy. Um, and these patients had some high-risk features that would suggest that they might be very sick, including a high level of something we call LDH. A lot of these patients had involvement of the liver, which is a bad sign. Uh, and three of these patients actually had the eye melanoma in the brain, which is also a bad sign. And so most of these patients got um, the ipilimumab at the FDA-approved dose of 3 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and so what we did was we looked very carefully to see how these patients did trying to learn as much as we could from these 20 patients. I worked very closely with a radiologist, Mark Bluth, and had him review all of the scans retrospectively. So this was a lot of work on his part. Um, but what we found was um, that if you look at um, the number of patients who had major tumor shrinkage, and by major we're saying 50% uh, shrinkage in, in their disease, of those 20, we had one patient to achieve that. And that's th this patient kind of highlighted here in red. This is something called a a spider plot. It's a little bit hard to read. There are a lot of lines there, so I apologize. But basically, each line here represents a patient. Um, as you go across here, this is time. And if the line goes down, that means the tumors are shrinking. If it goes up, it means the tumor is growing. And so this is the one patient who had major shrinkage um, fairly early on in the treatment course. Um, and here's just some of the images. He had a little bit of shrinkage in the liver lesion. There's this lymph node here, which shrunk down as well. Um, but interestingly, if you look at this line here, this is a patient who actually didn't have major shrinkage uh, until about 35 weeks in, and then it started to shrink. And so I suspect some of you have been treated with ipilimumab, and some of you have been told, well, sometimes it can take a long time for it to work. And this is a case where that, in fact, was, that, that's what happened there. So, you know, bottom line, um, I think we can see um, patients with eye melanoma benefit from this drug. At least in this experience, it tends to, it seems to be a, you know, a relatively small number of patients. Um, there are other series that have been published by other groups, and they kind of look the same. Um, but again, it'd be very nice to have a prospective clinical trial, you know, where we select the patients and kind of know their characteristics to really know does this drug work or not in general, inocular melanoma. The other thing I'd want to point out is this partial response rate, or this, you know, likelihood of major shrinkage is about 5%. It's pretty low. Um, but if we look at the field of eye melanoma in general, and this is just um, a series of published trials, you can see that all of the response rates tend to be pretty low. Um, and so this is kind of, unfortunately, what we're used to seeing in this disease. It's a tough one to treat. So that's kind of, you know, where, where, we, where we've been. But the question is, how can we make things better? Where are we going? Um, and Dr. Kaufman talked about personalized medicine, precision medicine, you know, and what does that mean? He's right. It means something different to everybody. But it does mean, uh, in the end, understanding the biology of each patient's individual tumor and figuring out what's making that grow and then figuring out what we can do to shut that down or turn something on that should, that should be on if it's off. Um, and so we do a lot of um, really just complex genetic and molecular profiling. And more and more we're doing this on a routine basis. Um, you know, in my practice, we're doing, um, you know, a 340 gene panel routinely on every patient that we see to help guide our therapies, um, maybe not the initial therapy, but if they need something in the future in terms of a clinical trial, we have a better sense of what, what we think might work. And in eye melanoma, 
Um, we do have a, a we do know a number of these key uh, molecular events. Um, we're able to actually divide patients by uh, a gene expression signature into what we call class one tumors. Those patients tend to do very, very well. Those are very relatively indolent cancers um, that tend to be cured with surgery or radiation alone. Or there's a class two genetic profile, which tends to be more aggressive. Um, we know what some of the key molecular uh, mutations are, the more frequent ones. Um, and the one that I want to focus on are these mutations in genes called GNAQ or GNA11. Um, and this is going to be a scary slide, <laughs> so I know that. But I just wanted to tell you a little bit about GNAQ and GNA11 uh, in, in somewhat of a, a simple way. But this is kind of um, a more complex cartoon from what Dr. Kaufman showed, where there are these recept this is a cell surface, and there's this receptor here. Um, and if something lands on the receptor, it turns a lot of pathways on. But part of one of the key molecules in early on in this pathway is um, something called a G protein. And GNAQ or GNA11 um, kind of encode for this protein here. And when those genes are mutated, this protein is always turned on. It shouldn't always be turned on, but with that mutation, it's always turned on. So it's always telling the cell to grow. Um, and so when that happens, um, a lot of pathways are turned on when they should be turned off. Um, and one of the key ones is this so-called MAP kinase pathway. And so we thought maybe if we could turn off that pathway, maybe we could get some benefit, um, control the cancer, shrink the cancer, maybe hopefully make it all go away. And so very early on, um, we started um, studying this in the laboratory. Um, we started working with the National Cancer Institute um, and drug companies to try to see if we can get a drug into people to see if this actually works. And so um, last year, we reported um, um, really the, f the first positive clinical, a randomized clinical trial um, in, in patients with ocular melanoma. And so, you know, Dr. Coffin thankfully went through some of these study designs, but this was a phase two clinical trial, and it was randomized, where patients with ocular melanoma um, who have not received prior chemotherapy were randomized either to chemotherapy or this new pill, which turns off that MEK protein. Um, and, you know, because we were concerned that we wanted to give everyone access to the MEK inhibitor, if they were randomized to chemotherapy and it, and it didn't work, everyone could get the MEK inhibitor later. So that's one way we try to be as fair as possible. Um, and so what we showed here is that with the MEK inhibitor, the new drug, we got shrinkage in more patients um, than in chemotherapy. So these are what we call a waterfall plot. So this is a different type of plot, where here each bar represents a patient. Um, and if the bar goes up, that means the cancer has grown. If the bar goes down, it means the tumor shrinks. And what you can see with chemotherapy is very few of the patients had any sort of tumor shrinkage. Most of them had it grow. And so it turned out that of the 46 patients we initially reported on, 11% had a little bit of shrinkage. None of it was major. It was just a little bit. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at this graph here, um, you can see that about half of the patients had the line go below that x-axis here. So most, half of them had a little bit of tumor shrinkage. In terms of major shrinkage, it was still fairly modest. It's just 15 percent. Um, but given the historical activity of what we've seen with other drugs, this was not awful. Um, this is actually a, a, um, a, really, a young lady from um, California who we treated on the study who had this tumor in her eye. Uh, before she started that MEK inhibitor. Um, and really, just after a month of therapy, you can see how much that improved. And she had improvement in this liver lesion here. That spot there is a liver spot, and that shrunk down. And when you guys get PET scans, um, this is kind of what the images look like. If it lights up, it means it's very metabolically active, and cancer is metabolically active. And you can see that after two months of therapy, uh, that, that has uh, decreased significantly. And so, um, again, just as, as to reinforce how much we work together, um, you know, we started the study at, at Sloan Kettering, but we couldn't do this alone, given the rarity. And so we, we worked with 14 other centers in the U.S. and in Canada to make sure that we could um, give patients access to this therapy everywhere and try to get the question answered as fast as possible. Um, and so we published this results. It was a huge collaborative effort, um, and it did show that uh, for the first time ever we found something that controlled cancer. Um, can be better than something else in chemotherapy. So I think that was a major step forward, um, but it's obviously not the answer. If we answer, um, I don't think we're going to be happy with the answer until we find the cure. 
Um, and so we have to see how we can make those therapies better. And so here's our complicated graph again. Um, and again, with that one pill that we studied, we shut this off. But we know in the lab, if we shut off other proteins, like this AKT protein, then we can get better effects. Um, and so we've studied that in the lab, and now, again, we're working with um, the National Cancer Institute, um, as well as a different drug company now called um, GSK, or GlaxoSmithKline, to try to really see in patients if that combination is better than the one drug alone. And so, again, it's a randomized phase two trial. Um, some patients are randomized to the MEK inhibitor alone, and here we're using a different one than we initially studied, um, and half of the patients get the combination. And again, if you're randomized to the one pill only and the cancer grows, you can always get the other pill later. Okay, so everyone has access to the full combination. Um, and so this study is, um, is still ongoing, so I don't have the answer for this one. But in an effort to try to make this one um, go as fast as possible, what we've done here is, is we've actually recruited other sites from, from Europe and the UK as well. And so we're going to do this as an international trial. Again, just in an effort to enhance collaboration, answer the questions as fast as possible, and you know, hopefully give patients access to some of these newer treatments everywhere. And so uh, we're doing this through what's called this International Rare Cancer Initiative, which is a, really a working group between um, our, the National Institutes of Health here, um, a group in Europe called the URTC, and a group called Cancer Research UK in, in, um, in, um, in England. Um, and again, they've actually targeted nine different rare cancers, um, and their goal, again, is to try to enhance this collaboration. Let's work together, okay? That's, that's what we need to do. Um, one thing that, um, that's important for the drug development process is even though we were very happy about that first trial where we showed that MEK inhibition is better than chemotherapy, to get a drug approved, um, you typically need two trials to show that. And so what now we're working with AstraZeneca to try to do that second trial. Uh, and that's, it has a, you know, fancy name. This is what we call the summit trial. And this is now a phase three trial uh, where patients are going to be randomized to either uh, the MEK inhibitor, and in this case with chemotherapy or chemotherapy alone. Um, and here to make things as fair as possible, the randomization is such that of every four patients who are treated on this trial, three get the, um, the MEK inhibitor and one gets the, the chemotherapy alone. <clears throat> and again, here, if you get the chemotherapy alone, you can always get the other pill later, okay? Um, so this trial started uh, about six months ago, and it's more than halfway accrued. So, so we actually may have the results of this um, by mid-next year. Um, and if it looks like, you know, what we are hoping, um, then we very well may have the first approved drug for ocular melanoma, which would be really, I think, a great step forward for the field. Okay, here's that complicated slide again. <laughs> the reason why I bring this up is that there are clearly a lot of other targets that we have to, to evaluate. And so, um, you know, there are a number of clinical trials going on, and these are clinical trials that we're doing just in ocular melanoma, uh, looking not just on drugs that turn off that MEK protein, um, but we're looking at drugs that block other critical proteins, things like PKC. Um, and obviously, immunotherapy is, is an important part of I think how we're actually going to beat this disease. And so we have to look at the efficacy of immunotherapy in, in ocular melanoma as well. And so there is a series of trials. Um, and I was just talking to Dr. Kaufman about another one that we'd want to do uh, working together. So in summary for the eye melanoma part, um, uveal <coughs> melanoma is a distinct disease entity. Uh, and it's distinct from skin melanoma. It has a unique biology. It has a response pattern to systemic therapy that's different than skin melanoma. Um, the currently available treatments for cutaneous melanoma um, seem to have limited efficacy. It may not work as well in ocular melanoma. I don't know that for sure, but that's what it seems like based on the available evidence. Um, but I think it is worth looking at IPI um, and maybe drugs like the PD-1 drug in more detail. Um, I think understanding the biology of this disease is really important. If we don't understand the biology, we're not going to make any progress. Um, and you know, again, I, I'm a huge advocate for clinical trials. I think if there is one that makes sense for patients, I, I think it's a great thing to do, only if it makes sense for you and if it's the, you know, potentially right therapy, but it's the only way we're going to find a cure for this. So for the next few minutes, um, I just want to kind of switch over to mucosal melanoma. Um, this, is, this is actually a very rare subtype of melanoma, and this is a melanoma, these are melanomas that arise from what we call the mucosal surfaces of the body, things like the mouth or the sinuses, the anorectal area or the vulvovaginal area. So they're very, very uncommon. 
Um, and this is a very frustrating and tough disease to treat um, because even if we compare outcomes by size or depth um, with cutaneous melanoma, patients seem to uh, unfortunately get very, very sick very fast, uh, more so with, with mucosal melanoma. Um, just to highlight some of the differences, um, you know, some very easy things to look at between cutaneous melanoma and mucosal melanoma. The patients who get mucosal melanoma tend to be a little bit older. Um, it tends to happen a little bit more in females. In large part, that's because of the, the development of vulvovaginal melanoma, which obviously doesn't happen in guys. Um, you know, when we look at skin melanoma, we know the incidence is rising really rapidly, um, but mucosal melanoma has remained fairly stable in terms of how often it happens. Um, some interesting things, um, you may have heard of amelanotic melanomas, uh, which sometimes happen. These are melanomas that aren't pigmented. They aren't you know, black spots on the skin that you're used to seeing. And we see that sometimes in skin melanoma, but it's actually fairly common in mucosal melanoma. Um, and this is, you know, I, I, sometimes I don't like showing how, how some of these depressing numbers, but the numbers are depressing. If you look at the number of people who are alive in five years with, um, with mucosal melanoma, it's, it's, it's way too low. It's way too low. Um, and so because of how aggressive this disease is, um, people have been very interested in trying to develop treatments in, again, the adjuvant setting. You know, after surgery, how can we prevent it from coming back? That's a very, very important thing for us to do, both for skin melanoma and actually every cancer. And Jun Go uh, is an investigator in Beijing who does a lot of melanoma work. And um, they see a lot of patients with mucosal melanoma there. And so he did this trial uh, where he randomized nearly 180 patients with mucosal melanoma after surgery um, to either observation, which is really the standard of care. Let's, let's watch you closely, see how things go. Hopefully, hopefully all works out. But in the absence of an effective therapy, that's a reasonable thing to do. Um, a group got interferon for a year, and then a group got chemotherapy. And then he saw, he looked at, to see how those patients did. Um, and this is a, what we call a relapse-free survival curve. And so um, over here, we have time going um, left to right. Um, and then here is the percentage of people who are doing well. And so you want the line to go like this. You want the line to be all on the top. Uh, the closer you are to that, the better. And what you can see here, the line that's closest to that is group C, which is a chemotherapy group. And this group did much better than the interferon group or the group that was just observed. And you saw the same pattern if you look to see how, how long people live. It's that group C group that did better. And so this is very in intriguing data. And I remember, I think we were probably all at the presentation when Dr. Goh gave this. Uh, and it was, very, it was a very interesting reaction because this is unbelievable data. Um, and, and if this, in fact, is true, clearly chemotherapy is the right thing to, to do. Um, I'd be very, if you guys are writing questions on your index card, I'd be very interested to see what the other doctors here would recommend. If after surgery for mucosal melanoma, should we do chemotherapy given this data? It seems obvious, but the answer isn't. Um, and it isn't for a few reasons. One, um, the data is very strong, but this was all done in China. So this is, this is a Chinese patient population. And the question is, does that apply to um, a Western population? It may or may not. Um, we know that the genetics of mucosal melanomas in China are different than the genetics of mel mucosal melanoma in a Caucasian population. So that may cause some differences. And so what we really need to do is, is reproduce this study we have to redo this study, because if there's a second study that confirms this, then clearly everyone is going to do it. Um, and so this is a little bit of a plea. I think we all struggle with questions of funding, because we know what the important question is. Um, but um, the reality of kind of the finances of drug development is that no one's going to fund this trial, um, although it's an important question. And we'll try. And so it, it you know, and this is why groups like AIM at Melanoma uh, other advocacy groups are so important. That's why funding is so important, um, because I, I think it'd be an amazing thing to do to, to reproduce this trial, and I know there's be a, there would be a lot of support for it. Here again are the FDA-approved drugs for melanoma, and uh, similarly to what we did with um, ocular melanoma, we looked at, oh, sorry. So here are the approved drugs. Um, these are, you know, before we had IPI and VEM, groups looked at whether we could use chemotherapy or biologic therapies like interferon, or the combination, which is biochemotherapy, to try to treat mucosal melanoma. And the MD Anderson group did a ton of this work. 
And so they, did a, they treated a group of patients with melanomas arising from the head and neck uh, with biochemotherapy, which is an aggressive combination of interferon and IL-2 and chemotherapy. And they found that they could get major tumor shrinkage in, over 50 in around 50% of cases. Uh, they did the same thing for anorectal mucosal melanomas and, again, found a very high response rate and did the same thing with vulvovaginal. Again, so they could get major tumor shrinkage in a, a significant proportion of patients they treated. Um, but, and again, so you look at that data and you say, well, that must be a good thing. And it might be a good thing. Um, but one caveat to that is if we looked at a randomized trial in skin melanoma where patients either get the combination of the biologics and chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone, and look, does that help people live longer? Um, it doesn't. Um, at least based on this ECOG trial. You can see those curves are completely overlapping. And so the question is, you have to ask is, why are we doing it? If we're doing it because we need major shrinkage, then yes, do it. Uh, if we're doing it because we think it's going to help people live longer, well, that maybe not so much, okay? Um, so we looked at IPI, and this was our experience um, at three centers, actually. We, looked, we worked with the group in Boston. Uh, and we worked with a group in Switzerland, and uh, we had, between the three groups, 33 patients with mucosal melanoma treated with ipilimumab here. Um, and again, this is that spider plot again. You can see that some of the patients actually had major shrinkage. One patient actually had a complete disappearance of all the cancer. Um, other patients had uh, less significant shrinkage. So again, you know, IPI can work in mucosal melanoma. It's a reasonable treatment. Um, it would be great if we could study this more formally, but it's challenging to do when there's so few patients with that disease. Um, one of the big, I think, important um, observations, and this is all old, you can see the dates from 2005, and this is actually relatively old news now, but um, this was a finding um, that different clinical subgroups of melanoma had different genetic patterns. And so if you look at the more common melanomas, these are the melanomas arising from what we call non-chronically sun-damaged skin. This is most of the melanomas we see. Um, these are the ones that have the BRAF mutations and can respond to things like the marafenib or dibrafenib or trametinib. Um, and some of these will also have mutations in a different protein called NRAS. But if you look at KIT, which is that, uh, that receptor that um, Dr. Kaufman mentioned, these almost never have mutations in KIT. Whereas we, if we look at less common subtypes, like mucosal melanoma, and this is a gentleman with a, a melanoma in the mouth, you can see that they less commonly have BRAF and NRAS mutations, more commonly have alterations in that KIT protein. And so Dr. Kaufman was talking about how we used to meet regularly in New York. And early on, we actually talked about, well, how should we, what should we do with that information? And you know, a group of us in New York actually said, well, why don't we see if we can just pick patients with those kit mutations and treat them with a drug that turns that off and see what happens. Um, and we've done that with other subtypes as well. You know, most of the melanomas have BRAF mutations, um, but we know that a subgroup has NRAS. And so other groups have looked at whether certain treatments work in NRAS mutant melanomas, and there's data to say that pills that turn off MEK might work. Our ocular work was based on the presence of these GNAQ and GNA11 mutations in a small group of melanomas, mostly the oculars, and so that led to the finding of selametinib. And so with KIT, which is overall mutated in just a small proportion of patients, uh, we looked at the use of imatinib, which is a pill that turns off KIT, and saw, looked at, does that help? And so this is another type of plot. These are 25 patients, all of whom had melanomas with an abnormality in that KIT protein. And you can see that um, this is time on studies. So um, the longer they're on trial benefiting, the longer that bar. And so what you can see here is that two of the 25 patients had the cancer completely go away with a drug. Um, this patient um, is actually still on drug um, since 2009. So if it works, it can work for a long time. A couple of the patients had um, kind of not complete disappearance, but um, major shrinkage. Um, and uh, this patient was on study for, I think, three years total. And so what this shows is that um, the drug can work in some patients, but not all of them. And this, this speaks to that personalized medicine or that precision medicine, because what we have to do is figure out why did it work in these four patients really well, and why didn't it work in these patients. Um, you know, this is one patient who did work. This was a patient with a, a vaginal uh, melanoma, and you can see it here. Um, this, it's this spot here, and it's abnormal on PET. Um, and when I met this patient, she had a lot of pain, a lot of vaginal bleeding, uh, and within days of starting the imatinib, all of that stopped, which is really dramatic. And you can see 
On scan at week six, uh, this mass is almost completely gone, um, and it's certainly less active on the PET scan, and by week 18, it's very hard to see. Um, and this is a patient with uh, an acral melanoma rising from the sole of the foot. You can see all of these black spots there are spots of melanoma. After six weeks, significantly improved. After 12 weeks, you know, this is essentially normal. And on biopsy, um, you know, around this time, you know, what you see here is some pigment. But there's no live melanoma there. And so this was a guy who had the cancer completely go away with the pill. If you look overall at uh, kind of three of the studies that have been completed of imatinib in, in melanoma that, with a kit alteration, you can see that it only shrinks tumor in maybe 16 to 23 percent of cases. Okay, and so how do we pick those cases? Um, this is work by Jun Go, again, from Beijing. And what he showed is the majority of the um, patients with shrinkage um, had a mutation specifically affecting certain parts of that kid gene. Um, and it only worked if the mutations affected a part of the gene called exon 11 or another part called exon 13. And indeed, if we look at kind of the entire literature of patients treated with imatinib or other pills that turn that off, you can see that the patients who respond almost universally uh, have those mutations. And so maybe this is how we're supposed to pick people. You know, maybe it's not enough to just have a mutation in a kit. Maybe it needs to be a select a mutation. And so this, in part, speaks to the complexity of how we're trying to figure this out. It's not as easy as, as you know, any of us would hope. Um, this is a study. Hasn't been published yet. Hasn't been presented yet. So this is kind of secret. <laughs> I'm going to present this at ESMO. But we did a trial where we took patients um, who got Gleevec for their melanoma. Um, and maybe it worked for a little bit, maybe it didn't. But after that, we put them on another kit inhibitor called nilotinib. And um, here, again, it's the same sort of thing like you saw in the other study. But here, each bar is a patient. And the red part is when they're on the imatinib, the first one. And the, second, the blue bar is when they were on the second one. And what's really interesting here is this is a patient who was on imatinib. This is a patient of mine, actually, who was on imatinib for over a year, had major shrinkage in her tumor, but then it regrew. And then we put her on nilotinib. Um, and this is, um, this is probably 2011 at this point. <laughs> and you can see she's still on it with a major response. And we saw a similar thing here where this patient was on imatinib for 20 months. And then it, actually, in this patient, it completely went away. Um, radiographically on scans, but then it regrew. And then we put her on nilotinib, and, and then she got another year of benefit out of that. So this tells me that in some patients, we might be able to sequence or use a different kit inhibitor if the first one stops working. So, so it's, it's complicated. I'm sorry for all the complex slides, but I think I'm hoping that it's a little bit useful in giving you some insight to kind of how we're thinking about how we can kind of find better therapies. So in summary, for the mucosal part, I, I do think that kit inhibition can work in a subset of melanomas with select alterations in kit. And we have to figure out how to pick those patients. You know, that's, that's actually the hard part. And so when we figure out, you know, why it works, why it stops working, I think we can more smartly figure out how to, how to build the next steps. Uh, and overall, um, I think you've gotten a sense that melanoma is really clinically and biologically diverse. And each distinct melanoma subtype really requires distinct therapies tailored to the unique biology. So it's really important. It's really complicated. And we do need further research in both the common and uncommon molecular subtypes of melanoma. All right, that's it. <laughs> Thank you guys for your attention. <laughs>